Hi everyone, welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Jitendra. This is a conversation with Aurora Caselli. She is a scientist at NASA Exoplanet Science Institute at Caltech. Here we talk about how do new stars and planets form? How do we detect them? Measuring the weather of exoplanets and studying whether to detect alien life. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi, Aurora. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so as a scientist who is working on uh, weather of uh, exoplanets, um, what, what's your motivation to start uh, on such kind of topic? Um, well, actually, I think a lot of um, astronomers have known that they wanted to be astronomers their whole life. Um, and, you know, it's something that they've been working towards. You know, they got a telescope when they were little. Uh, but for me, I actually just, well, not just, um, but started being interested in astronomy um, in college. And I always have liked science and I've always been interested in doing some sort of science. But I, feel like I didn't have that much exposure to astronomy when I was younger. Um, and uh, then in college, I took my first astronomy class and I thought it was just so cool. Um, and yeah, I've kind of never wanted to do anything else since. Um, I think it's just pretty amazing that I get to think about planets and uh, outside of the solar system and kind of the things of sci-fi. Uh, every day for my work. And, um, you know, I have been like a, a sci-fi and fantasy fan my whole life. So um, that's definitely a, an added bonus that I kind of get to research the things that I like to read about in um, all of these like sci-fi and fantasy books and stuff. So yeah, that's, uh, that's why I'm into astronomy. Yeah, I think, of course, that's fascinating. And as you already kind of uh, categorized all the astro astronomers, uh, so what's what's that feeling when you are, because uh, I think most of the people on, on the planet, they have never uh, looked through a, a telescope, right? So what's what's that feeling like? You know, what, what do you, uh, or what can you define it as? Yeah, I think it's... Um... Looking through a telescope is such an amazing experience because you really can see uh, for your with your own two eyes, you know, other planets. Um, even a really small telescope or binoculars, if you have access to those, um, and you look at the moon, you can actually see the craters on the moon. You can see that it's not just this white blob. You can see that there's features. It's a it's a geological surface. And even with a small telescope, you can see um, the rings of Saturn. Uh, and it looks almost fake. When you look through a telescope, you're like, whoa, I can't believe that I can see this from Earth. Um, you don't need like a, a, you know, a probe or a mission or anything. Like you can actually see it. Um, so it's a pretty incredible experience uh, actually looking through telescopes. And now that I look through, um, a uh, giant telescopes, it's not quite the same because you're kind of uh, in a room. And now with Corona, oftentimes you're in a room in your own house and you're controlling this telescope, um, you know, on the other side of the earth. But it's still, when you actually think about what you're doing, you're controlling this giant 10 meter dish and pointing it at um, a different world and trying to look at this different world. It's, it's really, it's really amazing. Um, stopping and thinking about it. Wow. And um, how far, what, what uh, that distance can be uh, of the planets that you're looking at? Um, so um, the work that I do is on trying to characterize planets that we've already discovered. And so um, the planets that I'm trying to characterize are mostly going to be uh, the closest planets, because those are going to be the ones where we can actually uh, see the most things. Um, and so most of the planets that I'm looking at are probably uh, in the solar neighborhood. And what that means is within 20 parsecs, or maybe um, 
uh, less than 100 light years away um, on average. Um, and so these ones are just going to be uh, the brightest targets to look at. And um, with our current telescopes, we can really only look at the brightest and closest planets to us. Yeah, and uh, how much is that one light year is in the Earth time? Like if, if you can define. Um, let's see. So one, the closest uh, planet that's not in our solar system is the Proxima Centauri planet system. And um, actually recently there was just a really exciting press release. So it's a small star. The star is like one tenth, uh, no, maybe uh, somewhere between one half and one tenth the size of the sun. So it's um, a much smaller star. And so far we think that it has three planets orbiting it. Um, and one of them um, is potentially in the habitable zone of this star, which means that it's the right distance for water to exist on the surface as a liquid. Um, and so this closest uh, system is, um, uh, I think about four light years from us. Um, and so uh, at even one tenth the speed of light it would take 40 years uh, for us to get there. Um, so yeah, and we don't have anything that's going at one tenth the speed of the as the speed of light right now. So um, currently these systems are not, we're not going there. Um, we, we maybe someday after our, uh, our lifetimes, humans mm -hmm. will be able to send a probe there. But for now, we're just looking at them with telescopes and they're way too far to go to. Wow, it's fascinating. And um, how do you, uh, so how do you define the habitable zones? Like, yeah, so habitable zone is just a term that we use right now. Um, and it just means that the um, temperature of the planet will be right in order for water, if water existed on the planet, to be liquid. So, um, in our solar system, if you think about Mercury, Mercury doesn't have any water on it, but if it did, it would be way too hot on Mercury for water to be in a liquid ocean. It would be um, in a vapor form. And then if you think about planets that are farther than Earth, um, so, you know, the moons of uh, Jupiter, like Europa, water is on Europa, um, but because it's so far away from the sun, um, water is uh, ice there. Um, potentially it has a liquid ocean underneath, but that's because of um, actually tidal heating um, uh, because of Jupiter's interactions. Um, but yeah, so, so it just has to be the right distance away from the star um, so that the star's light warms it enough that you get water that can be a liquid, but not too much that it's a, um, that it's a gas. Uh, and this uh, right distance is defined by Goldilocks or Goldilocks zones, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Yeah, uh, and uh, one example is that we know is Earth. Uh, exactly, right. So anytime we talk about habitability and looking for life on other planets, we have to remember that we have a sample size of one. We have one planet in the whole universe that we are 100% sure where life exists. And so we try to do everything we can to think about other scenarios that could have life, but we're gonna be biased no matter what, because um, we only know about life as we know it, that's us um, and our planet. And so, um, you know, we try, we try to think about other scenarios and how life can exist in other scenarios, but we're definitely biased. And so a lot of these metrics that we're looking for, um, you know, the habitable zone, biosignatures, this is all based on life as we know it. Yeah, and so now your major work is uh, focused on measuring the weather of, uh, of exoplanets. So how do we define that weather or um, are we are just talking about atmosphere here? 
Yeah, so um, currently my work is on giant planets. And so um, I'm looking at, for the most part, um, some things, types of planets that we don't have in the solar system at all. So these are gas giant planets like Jupiter, but they're actually orbiting their star um, much closer than Mercury even orbits the sun. So these are really hot planets with um, hydrogen and helium, mostly thick atmospheres. And the reason that my work is focusing on this type of planet right now is because um, with our current telescopes, this is really all we can do. Um, and so if we want to learn about what's happening in the atmosphere, um, a good place to start is these gas giant planets because um, the atmospheres are kind of big and puffy. Um, and so they're the easiest to see. And the planets are so big um, that again, it's the easiest to see. Um, and so, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how these planets, um, how winds are circulating heat on these planets, how clouds form, um, are clouds kind of uniform, are clouds spotty? And so this is kind of the, uh, weather that I'm looking at on these planets is trying to figure out um, how the atmosphere circulate, what clouds, elements, atoms, molecules are in them, um, and that type of thing. Yeah, and um, does it also change with the time? Are you also uh, looking at the time dependency of the weather? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that is definitely um, just starting because um, well, we've really only uh, been looking at the atmospheres of planets. So the first exoplanet was, um, the first exoplanet around a sun-like star was detected in 1995. Um, but the first uh, sign of atmospheres um, actually looking to characterize planets wasn't until the early 2000s. And so we've been doing this type of science for less than 20 years. And it's really only picked up within the last, I would say, five to 10 years. Um, so yeah, the first kind of survey of planet atmospheres where multiple planet atmospheres were looked at and then compared was only done um, maybe in 2015, 2016. Um, so this is super new science. And so looking at how these planets atmospheres change over time is a really exciting prospect and um, definitely something that we are working towards, but we don't have very long of a baseline of data so far. Maybe for the most well-studied planets, we have a few years where we can compare. And because of how little resources we have, you know, we have a few big telescopes and there's lots of people who want to do lots of science on them. You can only get a measurement every once in a while. And so we don't have the type of data sets um, that we would really like to have. So uh, hopefully if we come back to this conversation in 10 or so years, um, we can answer that question better. <laughs> yeah, only if, the, if a meteorite doesn't hit the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so true. Yeah, and, and what about the, uh, so, so before you mentioned about this hydrogen helium um, atmosphere, basically that's what makes the, uh, makes the planets or uh, the, uh, the, the sun hot, right? Uh, the, the stars hot. So what's the, um, maybe we can just talk, talk a little bit about it because that's basically, I think, currency of, of the energy, right? Uh, okay, so um, the hydrogen and helium in the star is what makes the star um, uh, hot uh, due to nuclear fusion. Um, and so uh, larger stars are going to be hotter um, and smaller stars are cooler. Um, but I was talking before about the hydrogen and helium atmosphere on the planet. So in our solar system, um, we have rocky planets. So that's kind of Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And those planets have uh, a big rocky core and then um, either no atmosphere, so it's just kind of a rock sitting in space, or they have a small atmosphere around 
Um, and the atmosphere is mostly made of heavier elements. So on Earth, our atmosphere is mostly made of nitrogen. Um, and on uh, Venus and Mars, the atmosphere is a lot of carbon di dioxide, carbon monoxide. Um, and uh, this is different to the gas giant planets. So planets like Jupiter and Saturn, they have a core, a rocky core in the center. Um, well, actually this is kind of up for debate. They definitely have some sort of core, but it's unsure if it's a solid core or if it's kind of, um, uh, yeah, not like a core and then an envelope. Um, but they have a, a huge um, atmosphere that's mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. And actually most of their mass comes from this thick hydrogen and helium atmosphere, which also makes the planets really big. And they have an overall lower density um, than Earth because Earth is mostly rock and these planets are mostly hydrogen and helium. Um, and so uh, we kind of split we like to categorize as humans, we love to make categories. Um, so we like to split planets up into uh, rocky planets, um, gas giant planets, and then there's kind of the planets in the middle, which are kind of the Neptune and Uranus type planets, um, which do have a rocky core and they do have hydrogen and helium in their atmosphere, but it's not as big and as thick as the gas giant planets. So that's kind of what I was talking about before with the um, hydrogen and helium atmospheres on the planets. Yeah, and is there any correlation between uh, distance and the rockiness or gaseousness of the planets? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that's something that we are just uh, figuring out the answer to actually. Um, and so because of the way that we look for planets, um, we look for planets uh, either with transits, so we're looking at a star and we're waiting for the planet to pass in front of the star, or we're looking at the star um, and waiting to see um, a wiggle, and this wiggle happens, so a small motion, and this motion happens because um, the planet, uh, because of gravity, is pulling on the star as it orbits. And so because of, those are the two main ways that we find exoplanets. And for both of those methods, we have a bias where it's easiest to find close in planets that are really big. Um, and so when we first started finding planets, we found this type of planet that's Jupiter-like, but way closer to its host star than Mercury. And we had no idea uh, that this type of planet existed because it doesn't exist in the solar system. And none of our theories predicted this type of planet. In the solar system, um, all of the close-in planets are rocky. And as we get farther away from the sun, the planets become gas giants. And so we thought that this is kind of how it had to happen. And that's because um, when planets form, um, the closer to the star they are, um, the only things that are going to be solid are rocks. Um, everything like uh, water is going to be in a vapor form. And so when you're uh, creating a planet from all this material, you get solids that stick together. And so the close-in planets are only building up solids that stick together. And as you get to farther planets, there's more ices. So they can have these rocks and solids that stick together, but they can also have water ice or carbon ice. Um, and so they can build up a planet faster. And once they reach um, some certain size of a core, they start to also accrete gas onto the planets. And so our original theories for how planets formed predicted that all giant planets have to form farther away from the star and that rocky planets usually form closer to the star. But then we started finding these gas giant planets really close to the star. And it's actually an ongoing debate um, how that happens. And our best guess is still that they form farther away from the star and then they migrate in to a closer distance. Um, and so that's still our best guess. And um, if you extrapolate based on what we know our biases to be for how we find planets, we do find a relation where you get more gas giant planets as you go farther away from the stars. 
Um, and so even though we found all of these gas giant planets in close orbits at the beginning, it's actually a pretty rare scenario to get that. And it's most common to find gas giant planets actually somewhere between um, the distance of Earth and the distance of where Jupiter is in our solar system is kind of the most likely place to find gas giant planets. And then after about the distance of where Jupiter is in our solar system, you start to see less gas giant planets as well because there's less material in the disk that forms the planets. And so they can't build up enough material. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of how uh, uh, we think about how planets form and what type of planets exist where in different stellar systems. Yeah, and maybe you can, talk a little bit about those disks as well. So these are the planes basically created by uh, uh, because of the gravity and the stars? Yes, exactly. So um, stars form from big clouds of gas and dust um, that are cold and kind of compact, thick clouds. And they start to collapse. And as they collapse, they start to spin. And um, all of the material then collapses into a thin or collapses into a disk around the star. And you just kind of create this disk because of conservation of angular momentum. So anytime you have something spinning, um, anything that exists kind of perpendicular to the axis of spin is going to um, uh, resist falling onto the star. And so... Um, that's why in the solar system, we have the sun, and then we have all of the planets kind of in a nice disk. Um, and that's because that's how it naturally would form when you collapse a, a cloud of gas and dust. Um, and so we've actually taken some really beautiful pictures of disks around other stars in star forming regions. And, um, if you look these up, you can just look up like Alma star forming disc. And Alma is this giant array of radio telescopes. And the best way to image these disks is in radio wavelengths. Um, and not just because they're cold disks um, and uh, the radio telescopes are really good at picking up kind of that type of uh, cooler, um, uh, uh, yeah, cooler kind of material. Um, yeah, so, right, the planets, then you have a disk of gas and dust, and uh, some of these gas pieces, or sorry, some of these dust pieces start to stick together, um, and these are kind of tiny little planets, and then they start to hit each other and form and grow into bigger and bigger um, planets over time. Um, and so that's kind of the way that uh, we build up the size of planets. And this is still an ongoing question in astronomy, um, exactly how uh, you build up planets, because um, there's a bit of tension between uh, how quickly this actually seems to happen. So we're, we're imaging systems that are only, you know, a million or so years old, and it uh, oftentimes a few million years old, you already see um, planets forming. And so there's active uh, research looking into uh, how, how this process actually works and um, the best way to build up planets quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, so once, let's say the planets, they go um, at, at a certain distance and they get their angular momentum, uh, then it's also uh, like the other, the other thing is that what our, our planet like Earth does, basically that it also rotates on its own axis. So how conserved, like how preserved that property is when it comes to the planets? Right, the yes. planets. so you have all of the planets, um, you have lots of different orbits and spins and, and that type of thing. So you have the sun and it's rotating yeah. and then you have all the planets and they're orbiting. Yeah. And then you have each of the planets and they're rotating. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so you have all of these different uh, angular momentums and different orbits and stuff. Um, and actually these interactions between all of these planets and angular momentums um, 
can create lots of chaos uh, uh, because you have multiple planets interacting gravitationally. Um, they each have their own spin. They each have their own orbit. Um, and we think this is actually potentially one of the ways that we actually form these hot Jupiter systems that I was talking about earlier, where you have um, a gas giant planet close to its star, because we still think that they probably form um, farther away from their star. But all this interaction between all these different planets um, can potentially create um, gravitational interactions that'll maybe kick one planet farther away and kick one planet closer in. Um, and again, to conserve angular momentum, one needs to go farther away and one needs to come closer in. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of uh, dynamics and stuff going on. And um, when we find kind of these interesting systems, um, uh, there's, there's um, astronomers who work on uh, doing dynamical simulations to see if the system is stable over long periods of time. Um, and so that's another, uh, yeah, whole area of research doing dynamical simulations on all of these planets and their orbits and if it's actually stable in the long term. Uh, uh, do you know uh, how stable our solar system is? How long it's going to <laughs> stay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, our solar system is stable. Um, actually, uh, there have been some uh, large scale movements of planets, we think, in the past, um, but currently, uh, at least um, for the foreseeable future, everything seems uh, nice and stable. <laughs> okay, great. And yeah. <laughs> uh, the other good thing that we have on Earth is this day and night system, and that's because of the rotation of the, of the Earth. And when you mm -hmm. look at the exoplanets, so what is the case there? Uh, do we see this kind of transition transitioning happening always or? Um... Yeah, um, actually that's a, that's a great question. Um, and uh, some really interesting um, things about a lot of these planets is that they, uh, a lot of the planets that we look at, a lot of these close-in planets that we're looking at, they're tidally locked. And what that means is that one side of the planet is always facing the star. So the moon is tidally locked to the earth. That's why that we always see the same side of the, the moon. Um, and so one rotation of the moon around the earth is also equal to one day, if you think of it that way. Uh, so one orbit equals one rotation. Um, and so uh, a lot of these systems that we're looking at, they have uh, a day is equal to a year on the planet. So one time around the star is equal to one day. And so they always have a, a side that's facing the star. And um, a lot of the habitable zone planets that we hope to look at um, in the near future um, to look for biosignatures um, the best case for looking at these are planets that orbit really small stars. Um, and that's just because the stars are dimmer and so it's easier to actually see the planet. Um, and so actually planets that orbit these small stars, they orbit so close that they become tidally locked. And so um, potentially, uh, the first habitable zone planet that we are going to get to look at the atmosphere of, um, we think is probably tidally locked. And so we have no idea what that means for the conditions of life on this planet. Um, but what it does mean is that this planet is going to have probably, um, we, we haven't measured the rotate, the spin of the planet yet, but based on our like dynamical um, simulations, it's probably uh, become uh, tidally locked to the star. And uh, this is just something that happens over time. So each planet has a time scale where it will become dynamically uh, locked. And that's just because this is the um, equilibrium that uses the least energy. So over time, um, 
uh, it, it uses less uh, energy to be in a tidally locked orbit. So over time, uh, everything will become tidally locked. Now the earth will not become tidally locked for the sun. Um, the, the time scale for that is billions of years. So we're perfectly fine with our day and night. But if the earth were much closer, it would take a lot less time for it to become tidally locked. Um, and so, right, the habitable zone planet around the low mass star um, that we have planned observations to look at an atmosphere of a habitable zone planet for the first time, um, it is probably tidally locked. So that'll mean um, people have come up with all kinds of crazy scenarios where um, there's this region like right at uh, morning or evening or sunset where uh, would be this perfect location for any life to exist because on the side that's always facing the star, it would get pretty hot. And on the side that's never facing the star, it would be pretty cold, but maybe there's this like ring right at um, dawn and dusk um, around this planet where conditions are good. Um, so yeah, not all planets have the same type of day and night as us. Um, actually a, a fair bit of planets um, have a permanent part of the planet that's a day and a permanent part of the planet that's night. Yeah, um, that means you won't have to choose the party time. Basically, you can just cross the, the <laughs> ring and you can just start celebrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to think about uh, time as a location instead of waiting for it to pass to have day or night. You can just uh, move to the day part or move to the night part, depending on which you prefer. Yeah. Uh, the other thing uh, which we can talk about is the red dwarf uh, stars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are the small them. stars that I've been talking about um, that are the best for looking for, um, or we have the best chance of characterizing the atmospheres around this type of star. So um, these are stars uh, that are somewhere between half the size of the sun and one tenth the size of the sun. Um, and these are actually also the most common type of star in uh, the galaxy. So actually 70% um, of all stars are this red dwarf star. Um, so uh, not only are these the easiest type of stars to look for planets around because they're dimmer, but they're also by far the most populous type of star. And so um, most of the rocky planets in our uh, galaxy are going to be around this type of star. So um, yeah, it's, it's actually kind of interesting that uh, our star is a, a medium-sized star um, because yeah, it's not, definitely not the most common. So we are kind of out, outside of the normal. Um, and uh, when we look at the occurrence rates of different types of planets around different types of stars, um, we actually see trends where um, there are more rocky planets actually around lower mass stars. So our current estimates are that around the smallest of these red dwarf stars, there's on average three rocky planets in pretty close in orbits. Um, and uh, as we go to larger stars, um, so around sun-like stars, um, we think uh, about half of sun-like stars have a rocky planet in a kind of medium distance orbit, like what the Earth is in, um, in like a habitable zone type orbit. And so um, not only are these stars, okay, so now we're adding. So these stars are, uh, the most populous or like the, the, the largest number of this type of star in the galaxy. They also have the most rocky planets um, of any other type of star in the galaxy. And um, the planets around these stars are the easiest to characterize. So there's lots of reasons why you should be excited about planets around these type of stars. Um, so our planned observations of the first kind of rocky planets in habitable zones will be around uh, red dwarf stars. There's the famous uh, TRAPPIST-1 system, which you might have heard about in the news. And this is kind of 
um, one of these really small red dwarf stars with a system of lots of rocky planets. And um, at least one of them is in the habitable zone. And so with the JWST telescope, um, we'll be able to, for the first time, look at the atmosphere of this habitable zone, uh, rocky planet around the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, and I think let, let's go a little bit uh, more technical here. So when, sure. uh, when you say that we'll be able to look at the atmosphere means certain types of gases. Uh, so what are those gases and uh, are they like common in the universe, like at least the part of the universe that we are able to uh, visualize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the way that we look at the atmospheres or, yeah, I've been saying like look at the atmospheres of the planets is um, for the most part through transmission spectroscopy. So um, these planets are transiting. So that means that they pass directly in front of their star. And that's how they, that's how they were discovered. Um, and when the planet passes in front of the star, some of the light from the star filters through the atmosphere of the planet. And so you can take, um, basically you can take pictures um, in time as the planet passes in front of the star and break those pictures into uh, the wavelength of light. So it's a spectrum. Um, and you can look at uh, how much light passes through the star at different wavelengths. And if, for example, we wanna look for water um, and we see that uh, uh, the exact, so water absorbs and emits at very particular wavelengths. And so if we look at the planet, um, at a wavelength where we know water is absorbing or emitting and the planet actually looks bigger, that means that less light is passing through the atmosphere because water in the atmosphere is absorbing that light from the host star. So the planet looks bigger in wavelengths where uh, water emits and absorbs. And so that's how we can detect water in the planet's um, atmosphere. And because these signatures are unique with every gas, um, we can pretty unambiguously detect all these different um, molecules, atoms, ions in the planet's atmosphere. Um, and so the most common things that we've looked for um, and that we found are, you know, common gases that we have here on Earth. So we found water in lots of different planet atmospheres, um, water gas. Um, we found... Um, uh, methane, uh, we've found uh, ammonia. Um, these are kind of common gases. Um, and that's what we would be looking for when we look at uh, any exoplanet atmosphere is um, lots of different uh, common uh, gases. That's, that's fascinating. And um, so what, so now how uh, this James Webb a telescope uh, would help in a in a way that so whether it will increase the resolution or it will also in, increase that distance that we are um, trying to observe. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so uh, JWST is a infrared telescope, um, and so it's uh, fine tuned to look at the infrared wavelengths. And this is a great wavelength region to look at planets um, because most gases um, emit and absorb really strongly in the infrared. Uh, sorry, yeah, most molecule gases emit and absorb strongly in the infrared. So water has tons of absorption lines in the infrared, um, uh, methane, um, ammonia, all of these things. Um, and so uh, one, uh, JWST is great um, for the wavelength coverage. And two, it is the largest space telescope that we've ever launched. Um, so Hubble Space Telescope is about one meter um, and JWST is about six meters. Um, and so it's much bigger than anything that we currently have. And so we need this really big collecting area um, in order to see uh, these really tiny signatures. So in order to um, 
detect these gases in the planets, we're looking at something like a few parts per million in the change in the brightness of the star. So um, if you think about it, you know, the, the, the star is going to be at least 10 times bigger than the planet and the planet passes in front. And then you have to look at a change in the planet's radius that is caused by um, water in the atmosphere. So these are really tiny, like part per million signatures that we're looking for. Um, and in order to have uh, that precision, we need a lot of photons. So we need a really big collecting area and we need really precise instruments. And so um, JWST is going to be, um, yeah, just, just many times better than what we have um, so far. And also importantly, it's going to be in space. So we do have bigger telescopes on the ground, um, but when we're looking from the ground, we have to compete with Earth's atmosphere. So this makes it difficult because if we're looking for signatures of water in a planet, um, we also have water in our own atmosphere. So we have to be really careful that we don't accidentally detect water in our own atmosphere and not water in the planet's atmosphere. So there's lots of ways that we go about correcting this um, to make sure it doesn't happen, but it makes it really difficult to do this type of measurement from the ground um, because of our own atmosphere. Wow. Yeah, this is, uh, this is amazing. I mean, of course, because in, in my case, I've seen those videos where, uh, you know, it was, I think it was modeled that uh, there was this big star and uh, a small planet that it was passing through and how it was uh, uh, shown. So it's, it's amazing what you guys do. Yeah, um, the, the instrumentation um, and the people who work on that, it is really, really incredible that we really can detect changes in brightness um, of parts per million and um, for uh, radial velocities. So this is how we detect like the wiggle that I was talking about in the host star um, because of the mass of the planet. So for that, we're detecting um, all the way down to a centimeter per second um, centimeters, like 10 or 20 centimeters per second uh, precision on the uh, velocity of the star because of a planet. And so, yeah, just think about like a ruler and a few centimeters or, you know, uh, 10 centimeters, and then think about detecting that on a star that's light years away. And we're currently able to do that. And that's really, really amazing. And people who work on instrumentation, um, that's, you know, really incredible. Yeah. Uh, so why I was asking you about the uh, the gases on, on exoplanets, because let's say that if you see a, a kind of unique signature, and uh, at least on Earth, we know that at some point, this signature was changed because of the microbes. So uh, if you know, you can use those hints to already kind of uh, predict that there can be microbial life on certain planets. Yeah, biosignatures are hard. So that's exactly what we are going to be trying to do uh, when we're looking at these um, habitable zone Earth-like planets is looking for some gas indication um, when we do this transmission spectroscopy, we're looking for different gases. So we want to find some sort of um, gas signature that what we're seeing uh, could potentially be due to life. Um, and so people have proposed lots of different types of biosignatures. Of course, on Earth, a really good biosignature is um, molecular oxygen, O2, um, because that's what we as humans breathe, that's what plants create from photosynthesis. Um, and it makes up a large part of our atmosphere. I think currently oxygen O2 makes up something like 20% of our atmosphere. Um, and so uh, in order to um, you know, find a signature of life, uh, it has to be large enough that you can actually detect it. Um, and so, yeah, it would be, I mean, it, of course, it would be amazing if we could detect uh, oxygen on other planets. Um, 
and that would be good, a potentially good biosignature. Um, but there's other gases that also could be good biosignatures. People have um, suggested methane um, and uh, yeah, a bunch of other ones. Um, but you always have to be careful because even if we detect oxygen or methane or whatever um, on one of these planets, uh, there's always a possibility that this could be created in a non-biological way. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that we're gonna need a decent amount of evidence um, in order for a signature basically for for a single for a single detection of a certain gas i feel like we're going to need a bit more than that for us to say yes that's life um so yeah another another thing i think would be more uh indicative of life like you talked about before is um temporal variations so if we see oxygen or uh methane or carbon dioxide or whatever um, and the levels going up and down or something. Um, that would mean that some process is creating it and destroying it. And that process, if it's cycl cyclical, um, a good uh, indication would be that that would be life maybe. Yeah, basically messiness. So anything uh, messy, if we can find in the space would be an indication. <laughs> <laughs> the So what, what do you... Um, so what's your feeling about it? What's your, uh, what do you think? Is there uh, life elsewhere in the universe? I think that there's, uh, it would be pretty difficult for us to be the only ones. Um, we've, uh, I work for the NASA Exoplanet Archive and um, we've just uh, reached 5,000 uh, confirmed planets. And um, based on all indications, there's millions and billions of planets out there. Um, and for the conditions to have only been met one time on our planet, I think that, um, yeah, uh, I, I think that that's not likely. I think it's very likely that there is life on other planets. Um, the difficult thing is, uh, everything's far away. The, the galaxy is a really big place. And, um, you know, who knows what type of life it is? Um, are there other intelligent life? Uh, probably, but is that much more rare than microbial life? Definitely. Um, and so microbial life might be more difficult to unambiguously detect because it doesn't create as big impacts on the whole planet. Um, you know, we still don't even know if there potentially could be microbial life in our own solar system. We think that maybe even on Europa, there could be some microbes or Titan or uh, past Mars. Um, and so if we haven't even found microbial life, um, if there's still opportunity for microbial life to exist in the solar system and we haven't found it, then I think it's going to be a uh, a big challenge to find um, that type of life on other planets. Yeah, and what what kind of uh, technological advances you guys are expecting, which may help uh, speed up the process? Yeah, there's lots of great um, technological advances that are expected soon. Um, so one really exciting thing for looking at exoplanets is um, something called a star shade. And so currently um, the way that we look at these planets is and look at their atmospheres is through the transit technique, like I said. Um, but uh, there's tons of planets out there that don't happen to transit um, their host stars from our point of view. They have to have uh, the perfect alignment. And so maybe the closest and best prospect for life is a planet that's not transiting. And then what, do we never get to check out what the planet uh, is going on in the atmosphere? Um, and so um, what we're hoping to do uh, technologically next 
is actually be able to take a image of the planet itself. Um, and the way that we do that is we have to try to block out the light from the star. And so if you think about just taking an image of the planet star system, the star is just uh, tens of thousands of times brighter. And so you're never gonna be able to see the planet. But if you can basically, uh, if you think about like looking at the sun and you put your hand in front of the sun, then you can start to see things near the sun. Um, and so it's basically the same thing, the same idea that we just put our hand, or in this case, a star shade in front of our telescope that really effectively blocks out the light of the star. And then we can actually take a picture of the planet. Um, and so this is really exciting technology. And um, there's some test cases for star shades and a similar technology called coronagraphs. Um, there's actually coronagraph technology um, on JWST and on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is going to be launched um, later in the 2020s. Um, this is kind of early technology where we're testing it out. Um, and then our next big NASA flagship mission, um, hopefully we'll have a, a much better, uh, more advanced star shade technology where it'll allow us to actually take pictures of these planets. And when I say picture, I'm still not really probably meaning what you think of when I say picture, because the planet is still going to, it's not going to be spatially resolved. We're not going to be able to see, you know, clouds in the atmosphere um, and the whole surface of the planet. But what we will be able to do is um, take a spectrum of the planet and see what gases are there. We'll be able to observe it over time. We'll be able to see the brightness of the planet increase and decrease um, for night and day, like as the planet uh, orbits the star. And we'll be able to do this for planets that are not transiting, um, which is really exciting also. Yeah, so it's oh, still like right. um, um, getting this radio signal and then basically transforming it, uh, these radio signals into a picture, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you're kind of uh, making sure, making the light interfere with itself where you yeah. don't want to see the light and destructing it and um, optimizing a point on the uh, image where the planet is um, and making sure that the light then can come through from that point. Yeah, and I mean, I was also expecting that there'll be something or at least some dialogues going on uh, in in using AI in the coming time because that that's going to be uh, also crucial for us, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, already at this point, we are getting lots and lots of data, um, and so we're using. Uh, um, like AI techniques to sift through all of the data that we're finding, um, you know, with, with our transit finding missions like TESS, which is the Transit Exoplanet Survey Satellite, um, they, we're never going to be able to go through all of the data. Um, and same with these next generation telescopes. So we're already using very basic AI techniques to sift through the huge amounts of data that we're getting. Um, and of course, in the future, AI is just going to become more and more uh, efficient, uh, more sophisticated, um, and yeah, able to do so much more. So, okay, And uh, what are the major questions for you now? Uh, major questions for um, astronomy. Well, um, I think that the next maybe 20 or so years are going to be a huge leap forward in exoplanet atmospheres. So um, I think the last, uh, let's see, 30 years, about 30 years since we first discovered exoplanets, the goal was really to discover as many planets as we can. Um, let's see how common planets are. Let's see what type of systems they exist in. And starting a few years ago, we started kind of pivoting and 
yes, it's still great to discover tons of systems, but let's pivot and really try to characterize the systems that we see. Um, and so I think the next 20 or 30 years is all gonna be focused on um, trying to characterize all those systems that we found so far. Um, and so there's so many open questions. There's so many types of systems that are nothing like what's in our solar system. And we really only know very basic things about them so far. Um, actually, an interesting example is that the most common type of planet that we found um, is something that we don't have in the solar system. It's actually in between the size of Earth and Neptune. Um, and so either they're called super Earths if they seem to be a rocky density, um, but they can be up to like 10 times the mass of the Earth and about the same size, so super strong gravities, or um, uh, mini Neptunes. And so they still have these thick hydrogen helium atmospheres, um, but they're not you know, as giant as, uh, they're, they're only about two times the size of the earth. And so these are things that we don't have in the solar system, and we're really only just starting to characterize them. So there's just, there's so many open questions um, and there's so many uh, exotic types of planets that at this point, we just have a mass and a radius and a density and we know nothing else. Um, and this is kind of the next uh, generation of instruments are going to actually allow us to see what's happening on these planets. Um, you know, look at what type of gases are in their atmospheres um, you know, uh, how these atmospheres interact with their host stars, um, how are the atmospheres stable over long periods of time? Are they escaping? Are the planets disintegrating? Um, we have this whole population of earth like planets, but they're orbiting so close to their star that they are like crazy hot and they are probably covered in like magma oceans. Um, and that's another, you know, we don't have anything like that in our solar system. Um, so there's just so much left to do. Um, and it's going to be a really exciting time in exoplanet science. Yeah, it sounds uh, very exciting already. So yeah, that's, that's great. Okay, and uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation, uh, coming onto the podcast and sharing uh, your impressive work with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun.